Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 66, which is the last episode in this series on fungal physiology. Today, we're going to be taking kind of an outward-looking approach to fungal physiology. We're going to explore how fungi interact with the world around them. We're going to be talking about fungal ecology, and all of the symbiotic relationships that fungi have with other life forms. And, in a more general sense, we'll talk about how the fungi manipulate the world around them to promote life. Now, this ability on behalf of the fungi is a double-edged sword. With the very same physiological qualities that make them such good symbiotes, fungi can also be very effective parasites. Where on one hand, they can help life and promote the growth of habitats, on the other hand, they can just as easily discourage growth and harm habitats. If you've just finished listening to episode 62, then you should remember that fungi evolved the ability to break down lignin as part of their search for cellulose. While the individual fungi were only concerned for their immediate food needs, on an evolutionary timescale, the unconscious ecological consequence of this was the return of massive amounts of carbon back into the carbon cycle. This promoted a density and a complexity of life on Earth that would simply not exist in its present form had the fungi taken another 100 or 200 million years to evolve to break down lignin. All of that carbon that they would have broken down would have instead become locked in coal deposits, deep underground. And from our modern perspective, looking back in time, this evolutionary event was extremely important, as it had major consequences for the subsequent evolution and diversification of life. Seriously, the fungi literally released enough carbon back into the atmosphere and back into the carbon cycle that it could sustain the density of biomass that existed forever after. Without this fungal contribution, the world might never have experienced large, dense jungles, or dinosaurs that reached the size that they did. The world might never have given rise to humans, having lacked the carbon generally that was necessary for a global ecology capable of supporting such large, energy-expensive organisms and the forests that we lived in, that we evolved in. So, in this way, the fungi have had a subtle but powerful role in supporting life on Earth. And this is a theme that I'm going to explore in this episode. I'm going to touch on this over and over again. How fungi have mutualistically integrated themselves, ecologically and symbiotically, into the world around them, to a degree that few other organisms can rival it's important to understand just how diverse the fungi really are. They exist almost everywhere, even in places that you would think would be impossible. In the previous episodes, I talked about fungi needing certain environments to live in and to thrive. I generally talked about fungi preferring moist, shady areas and warmer temperatures that were good for their metabolism and growth. However, life and the fungi are not so monolithic. Fungi have adapted to a range of habitats outside of these boundaries, with many fungi that seem to just defy understanding. They live in places where you would never expect them to be. Although you'll always find fungus in the wet undergrowth of a tropical forest, you will also find them in the desert, having dark tissues coated with melanin to protect them from the sun's radiation, and dried out husks of hyphae to insulate them from heat and water loss. Some fungi that express melanin have even adapted to capture ionizing radiation, which can create a change in the electron spin resonance of melanin and make it a more efficient reducer of NADH. The end result is that the fungal cells grow faster because they can chemically process energy way more efficiently. This little trick with the ionizing radiation has allowed fungi to colonize Arctic and Antarctic habitats, where the background UV radiation is typically much higher than average. When I talked about saprophytic digestion in the episode on fungal nutrition, I mentioned that one of the environmental constraints is molecular oxygen. Saprophytic digestion is an aerobic process. It requires oxygen, so where there is none, where there is no oxygen, these fungi typically won't be able to dissolve their food to get nutrients. 
However, not all fungi use this saprophytic method to eat, and they've adapted to marine environments with relatively low amounts of molecular oxygen. Some fungi live in extreme proximity to water, perhaps requiring a standing body of water and partial submersion at all times. Or perhaps they're like chytrids, and they have some or all of their life cycle where they're just a single zoospore floating through the water. This isn't too surprising, considering that fungi are believed to have originated in a marine environment around a billion years ago, and they have since adapted to and spread across dry land. In extreme cases, fungi have been found in sediments and near hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean, where the pressures and temperatures are often extreme. Now, while most fungi live on dry land, feeding off of dead animals and dying plants, the fungi as a kingdom have the genetic and physiological capacity to live in almost every environment. This is one similarity that the fungi share with mammals, which have member species in almost every environment on Earth that isn't considered extreme, like inside a volcano, or at the bottom of the Dead Sea, or in a deep-sea hydrothermal vent. What this also means is that fungi can integrate macroscopic biology into almost every habitat, which will have profound effects on the inanimate matter and the conditions necessary for more life to come in and colonize the area. For example, hyphae can grow into extremely tiny cracks and pores in rock, chasing after water that may have drained down inside. The accumulated growth of the hyphae can split and break apart these rocks. And even though this happens slowly, over time it will accumulate as the fungal growth form virtually dissolves the rock beneath it into gravel and sand. Naturally, these softer, finer materials with better water drainage and better aeration than solid rock offer a suitable substrate for all manner of plants and burrowing animals. Along the edges of a river, the dead and decaying plant matter from trees, ferns, shrubs, grasses, and whatever else, it will all get dissolved and consumed by fungi. Their metabolic activity here in the riparian zone releases nutrients into the water, fertilizing it for all of the aquatic plants, animals, and microbes that live there. More free nutrients supports more growth at the primary level, which then supports the secondary, tertiary, and quaternary levels of the ecology. In every soil environment, from the riparian zone along the banks of a river, to the shadows of a jungle undercanopy, to a wide, dry expanse of grassland, the fungi play a critical role in nutrient cycling. By dissolving dead matter, they release those nutrients and that biomass back into the soil or back into the air. And this goes for pretty much every nutrient, be it phosphorus, potassium, nitrogen, sulfur, carbon, you name it. This perpetual reinvigoration of the soil promotes the growth of plants and soil microbes that can utilize these nutrients for their own growth and their, their own symbiotic and ecological relationships. There's a whole world of symbiotic relationships that exists between fungi and plants, but I'll get to that in particular in just a few minutes. The fungi do a huge amount of the chemical legwork needed to keep nutrient cycling through the biosphere. Much of this work involves chemical activity that's been shaped and finely tuned by selective forces for countless generations. It's evolutionarily very sophisticated. But the fungi also provide a much more basic, much more rudimentary service to their local ecosystems. They are food for other organisms, which come by and simply consume the mycelium. Insects, slugs, and snails, fish, and even mammals like caribou are all known to eat some kind of fungus. The caribou specifically eat a form of fungi called lichen, which is abundant pretty much everywhere, but it's an especially common item in the boreal north, in the taiga and tundra where the caribou live. Lichen is called a composite organism, which is an organism that's literally composed of multiple different individual species. The lichen is the growth form that appears when these species grow intertwined at a microscopic level. They're endlessly fascinating for many reasons, 
one of which being that a lichen growth form is distinct from the individual growth form of each symbiont species. To be a little more precise, lichen is the symbiotic growth form of two or more fungi, combined with a species of algae or cyanobacteria. In the lichen relationship, all of these interacting partners are called symbionts. The fungi is the mycobiont, meaning the, the fungal symbiont. The other symbiont is the photosynthetic species, which is called the photobiont. If the photobiont is an algae, then this is specifically called the phycobiont, where phyco is a prefix for plants, or plant-like. If the photobiont is a cyanobacteria, then this is called a cyanobiont. The lichen symbiosis first formed when the mycobiont and the photobiont began to work together to share nutrients. Each symbiont has its own qualities that allow it to optimize for certain tasks. The photobiont, for example, is photosynthetic, which means that when it's exposed to sunlight, it's able to consume carbon dioxide and water to produce molecular oxygen and various sugars. The sugars are the important thing that the fungus cares about, because it feeds off of these sugars to sustain its own body and to fuel its own growth. Because the fungi isn't breaking down plants or animals to get carbon saprophytically, it has to get its carbon from the photobiont that it cradles in its thousands of arms of hyphae. In return for these sugars, the fungi uses its hyphae to grow outwards and explore the substrate. These hyphae have an extremely high surface area, which makes them extremely absorptive of water and mineral nutrients. Much of the water gets supplied to the photobiont to allow it to continue conducting photosynthesis, and minerals like phosphorus, sulfur, and potassium are also shared between mycobiont and photobiont to support the production of DNA and the activity of enzymes. On a cellular level, the hyphae of the fungus form a superfine, tangled mesh characterized by heavy anastomosis, with the individual cells of algae or cyanobacteria all wrapped up and secured by the hyphae. The hyphae grow densely to produce sheets that form a cortex, or an outer skin for the lichen. Within the internal space created by this skin, the stuff inside is more loosely organized. The photobiont is held suspended by the entangling hyphae, which reach inwards from the inner surface of the skin to share nutrients. The fungi also produces structures that wrap around the photobiont cells and puncture them to create channels for mass nutrient exchange. These are often specific to the lichen growth form, and they don't appear or get expressed in related fungus that aren't lichenized. So this is an aspect of fungal physiology that's present only in the lichen growth form, but not in the lone fungus, not when the fungi is growing by itself. Some lichen fungi, like the basidio lichens, are known to try to create mushroom structures that resemble the mushrooms produced by other basidiomycetes fungi. But their attempted lichen mushrooms are altered and strange. The presence of the photobiont induces chemical and physiological variables that make for a kind of weird little mutant mushroom. Sometimes the photobionts are arranged under the cortex in a layer of their own, called a symbiont layer, and beneath this is a relatively open space called the medulla, where the hyphae are packed the least densely. Along the substrate, or the, the physical surface that the lichen is growing on, there might be a thicker layer of hyphal tissue, which creates rhizines that act like miniature roots, or rhizoids. These rhizines anchor the lichen to its substrate and keep it stable. The lichen, which is kind of like a biological textile, grows into dense tissue that can take several different forms, depending on the various fungal and algal or bacterial species that make up the lichen. Some of the more common growth forms of lichen are called folios, or fruticose growth forms, and these are just general morphological terms used to describe the shapes, or the shapes that they grow in. So, for example, a folios growth form involves little lobes, like small round leaves, that expand outwards, growing two-dimensionally over the surface of a rock or a tree. A fruticose growth form is three-dimensional. 
it grows to look like the miniaturized stems of trees or shrubs, with, uh, just without their leaves. Another common growth form is crustose, where the lichen grows as a thick, dense crust over its substrate, and the crust can crack or bend and warp in a way that looks remarkably similar to peeling paint. There's a number of other lichen growth forms, but for the sake of brevity, I won't list them all off. Just know that these growth forms aren't hard definitions, as lichen growth patterns often exhibit a blend of one or more qualities. These lichen are really neat, because they can live in a huge variety of places, just like the fungal symbionts that compose them. Because lichen are photosynthetic, they just need access to sunlight, water, and air to acquire carbon and make sugar. However, they don't produce roots, so their rate of nutrient uptake is generally low. In turn, this leads to a relatively slow rate of growth, which can be measured in millimeters per year. Lichens can grow on things like rocks or tree bark, but they don't actively tap those substrates for nutrients. They just grow on them, using them as a literal growing surface. They don't actually eat to the tree or try and eat to the rock. It's common to see crustose lichen growing on rocks, and in the case of endolithic lichen, it literally grows within the rock, between the mineral grains. Other lichens grow on leaves, or on or in or under the bark of a tree, often growing as an epiphyte on the trunk or somewhere out on the branches. In some cases, which is really common with a fruticose lichen, it might be attached to the substrate at a single point and its growth form takes its body radiating away from that one point, like a, like a miniature version of a tree stem branching and growing up and away from the ground. Vagrant lichens are those that aren't attached to any substrate whatsoever. These vagrant lichens get blown around by the wind or the rain, finding nutrients and water wherever they happen to go. Now might be a good time to mention that, unlike fungi, Lichens are often very drought-resistant, and they can weather arid conditions far better than a, a fungus growing just by itself. The lichens also have tremendous ecological value. They are called pioneering organisms, because they're often the first species to invade a new or an emptied habitat and colonize it, and alter that habitat in a way that makes it more conducive for other life to come in and live there too. For example, lichens release chelating chemicals, like metal oxalates, where they can chemically break down solid rock into mineral particles and dust. This creates rudimentary soils. The soil is made of particles, which can be moved and dug into. Animals can burrow into the ground, and the soil can now absorb and hold water, and plants can dig in their roots to find it. Furthermore, these sandy soils, as well as the sands of larger deserts, can be colonized by lichen that can help stabilize the soil and prevent it from washing out in the rain, or from being rapidly degraded by the wind. The soil stability further promotes plant growth, as vascular plants don't grow very well in loose, insecure soil. Lichen can also indirectly fertilize soil, by being food that gets consumed by other organisms and pooped out. For example, snails can eat lichen and produce nitrogen-rich feces that it releases in a trail behind it. The snail poop breaks down in the rain, and the nitrogen gets washed out into the soil for other organisms to enjoy. Again, going back to the caribou on the tundra, the caribou eat the lichen as a primary source of food, and naturally when they have to excrete their waste, this, uh, this fecal matter comes right back to the soil and brings those nutrients right back to reinvigorate the otherwise nutrient-poor tundra. The lichen are even involved in air quality. As the lichen have no cuticles or stomata or any other part of a plant that would allow it to regulate the air coming into its tissues, lichen can be described as biomonitors of their local habitats. If it's humid in the air, then the lichen is well hydrated. If it's dry, then the lichen is dry. If there's more of one gas than another in the air, this gas content, these relative concentrations, 
will be represented in the lichen. And this also applies to air pollution. Pollution like smog or smoke is absorbed across their entire bodies through diffusion, which can then accumulate in the lichen's tissues. Because lichen grows slowly, and they don't rapidly process a lot of nutrients or chemical energy, this exposure to pollution can potentially throw them out of whack and ruin the lichen symbiosis. Okay, so enough about lichen. I mean, they're really cool, they're really interesting, but they're still just small, flat growths on rocks and trees. Other life forms are certainly a lot bigger, more dynamic, and just by their raw size, they're certainly more influential on the local ecology than lichens. I'm thinking organisms like trees and other large plants. The plants define life on our planet in so many ways, from being the primary producers that turn light energy from the sun into chemical energy for ants to consume, to creating physical habitats with their bodies that other animals can use or live in, like birds, lizards, squirrels, and all manner of insects. Plants like trees are incredibly valuable organisms, and yet their global distribution and vitality is not due solely to the qualities of the tree itself. Many plants, including almost all species of tree, depend on symbiotic relationships with fungi in order to sustain themselves. Many plants and trees, like those in the orchid family, can't grow or maintain their bodies at all without the nutrient benefits that they get from their symbiotic relationship with fungi. The fungi involved in this kind of symbiosis are called mycorrhizal fungi. To summarize the general concept here, the mycorrhizal fungi integrates itself into the roots of the vascular plant, and together, plant and fungi share the nutrients that they are best optimized at acquiring. This integration takes place on a cellular or even an intracellular level. The basic gist of the, of the mycorrhizal relationship is similar to that involved in lichen, and for the same reasons. The plant is able to conduct photosynthesis, and it uses its photosynthetic tissues, like its leaves, to produce sugars. As much as 30% of these plant-produced sugars are given to the fungi in return for water and mineral nutrients. Naturally, the fungi isn't photosynthetic, and if it's not going to saprophytically break down detritus, then it has to get its carbon from somewhere else, like the sugar water in the phloem of a tree. Conversely, the mycelia has a ridiculously large surface area because of all of the uncountable millions of hyphae penetrating the soil. This makes the fungi way better at finding and absorbing water than the plant. Furthermore, even though they aren't getting most of their carbon through saprotrophism, they're still secreting organic acids and other corrosive chemicals out of their membranes into the surrounding environment. This will corrode rocks and create free-floating minerals, which can then be readily absorbed and handed off to the plant. There's a few types of mycorrhizal fungi, categorized based on the cellular strategy that they have for invading the plant's roots. The two main types are the endomycorrhiza, and the ectomycorrhiza. Endo is a prefix meaning within, while ecto is a prefix meaning without or outside, and this adequately summarizes their respective strategies. The endomycorrhizal fungi will grow to penetrate the plant's roots, and then they'll penetrate the cell walls of the plant cells themselves, protruding their hyphae into the cytoplasm within. Once inside the root cell, the hyphae will form a tangled ball, or a mass, called an arbuscule. This is like a little globular-shaped concentration of hyphae with a very high surface area, and so they act as points of nutrient exchange within the plant. The fungi can deliver its absorbed minerals and water directly into the plant cells, and the plant can supply its sugars directly into the fungi. Because of the intimate placement of the arbuscules, Deep inside the cells of the root tissue, you can see how this mechanism can potentially be exploited by parasitic fungi. Something kind of funny is that, while there are numerous fungi that parasitize plants, there are plants that parasitize fungi. These parasitic relationships are still mycorrhizal relationships, 
called monotropoid mycorrhiza, but they aren't mutualist. In this case, the plant is parasitizing the fungi for its carbon. Now, the ectomycorrhiza work somewhat differently, although, depending on how you see it, it's just as invasive and intimate as the endomycorrhiza. Instead of penetrating the plant cells and creating nutrient exchange sites within the cytoplasm, the ectomycorrhiza will grow their hyphae in strands that creep along the outside of the cell walls, between the cell walls of individual cells. Basically, the hyphae will flow into the root and fill all of the space between the cells. This will create a subnetwork of mycelium within the root itself, also known as a Hartig net. This Hartig net grows along the outer cells within the root, creating what's called a mycelial sheath. This sheath is integrated into the framework of root cells, which creates a massive interface for nutrient exchange, but it doesn't just end there. On the outer surface of the root, the ectomycorrhizal fungi will also generate a larger external sheath called a mantle. This mantle will cover up the root hairs that the plant typically uses to help absorb water, but the fungi compensates for this by using its own hyphae in their place. There's a few other strategies for mycorrhizal symbiosis, like arbutoid mycorrhiza, which is kind of like ectomycorrhiza, except it also penetrates plant cells like endomycorrhiza. So arbutoid mycorrhiza kind of do a combination of both. And then there's ericoid mycorrhiza, which only lightly colonize the roots by dipping their hyphae in a thin layer of the outermost cells. However, within these cells, the ericoid mycorrhizal fungi form thick coils of hyphae. I mentioned how orchids can't grow at all without mycorrhizal fungi. Well, these orchid plants typically use an endomycorrhizal strategy, where their mycobiont penetrates their cells and creates intracellular points of nutrient exchange. The mycorrhizal relationship offers numerous benefits to plants besides just raw inputs like water and minerals. While these are important, there are other organisms and other variables at play, and the fungi helps to moderate the impact that these variables can have on the symbiont tree. For example, mycorrhizal fungi can help plants colonize nutrient-poor soils by using the hyphae to absorb more nutrients than the tree would ever be able to absorb on its own, with its larger, thicker, clumsier, and more nutritionally expensive roots. In soils polluted with heavy metals, trees would normally be poisoned and killed by these metal toxins. However, trees that have engaged in a mycorrhizal symbiosis are much better able to withstand the pollution, as the fungi can selectively absorb the minerals that it wants, while keeping excess metals, or outright toxic metals, on the outside of the mycelia. In this way, the fungi acts kind of like a filter, and the tree mostly gets a healthy amount of healthy metals, despite the general toxicity of the surrounding soil. The benefits don't end here, either because the fungi are much more absorptive of water that can help plants survive droughts, and conversely, they can help protect and promote plant growth in water that has a high salt content. The fungi can even help prevent diseases in the plants by helping to regulate the soil and what kind of soil microbes can get near the plant's roots. All of these qualities have made scientists think that plants would not have been able to colonize dry land as rapidly as they did without the aid of fungi. Perhaps the wildest thing that I've ever read about mycorrhizal fungi is how they help defend plants against insects. By using their hybrid root mycelia networks, they can help generate and send signals between individual plants, warning them of the presence of an herbivore. Plants can do this on their own, by sending out herbivore warning signals, which cause them to release a group of aromatic chemicals called volatile organic compounds. These volatile organic compounds, which include things like salicylic acid, abscisic acid, and various oxylipins, among others, are designed to either discourage an herbivorous insect directly, or to attract predators of the herbivorous insect, to come and attack it and get it off the plant. 
The warning signal is a kind of hormone released when the plant detects mechanical damage, like the kind of damage that would be caused by an herbivorous insect coming and chewing on a leaf. Typically, this hormone will circulate throughout the individual plant's body, and the affected plant cells will produce the volatiles. However, when mycorrhizal fungi are growing in symbiosis with the plant's roots, they can detect this signal inside the plant, and they can amplify it. The hyphae of an individual mycelium will often meet and merge, or mesh, or uh, otherwise symbiotically intertwine and chemically communicate in some way with the hyphae of other fungal individuals. And in this way, the mycorrhizal fungi can create a huge, complex, underground biochemical communication network that's composed of multiple fungi and multiple trees. One mycorrhizal fungi can take this herbivore warning signal and propagate that signal to another fungi, attached to another tree. And that tree will begin producing the volatile organic compounds too, even though it may not have any herbivores currently chewing on it. Sometimes one mycorrhizal fungi can be connected to multiple trees, and other times one tree can have multiple mycorrhizal fungi, all relaying the signal in different directions. This signal radiates outwards, affecting numerous unafflicted trees and creating a widespread mass response in the forest environment. The mass response produces a tremendous chemical signal for the herbivore's predators, and their abrupt appearance and predation of the herbivore will protect the plant. Specifically, it protects the soft, photosynthetic leafy tissue that produces the sugar that the fungi need to eat. This underground network effect might seem to hugely benefit the trees. And it does. It really does. But you shouldn't misunderstand the apparent altruism of this relationship. Keep in mind that the fungi is working to preserve the tissue that's used to produce its food. At the end of the day, the fungi does have a selfish motive behind its evolved symbiosis with the plant. While fungi have evolved complex mutualist chemical relationships with algae, cyanobacteria, and vascular plants, they've also evolved mutualist relationships with insects. However, these relationships aren't generally based around a physical chemical integration of the fungus with its symbiont. Instead, the relationship is much more agricultural, like the relationship between humans and corn or wheat. And this is because the insects in question literally farm the mycelia for food. The mycelia cooperates with this farming because the insects will feed it and protect it. Various species of wood wasp, for example, are known to deposit their eggs into the wood of pine trees, along with the spores of the fungi Amylosterium areolatum. This fungal species is able to digest wood, and as it does so, it grows. As the fungal mycelium grows from eating the tree, the wasp larvae have a ready supply of nutritious food. The mother wood wasp is literally using the fungus as baby food, so the fungus is growing on its own, but by the nature of its inoculation into the tree alongside these wasp eggs, it's basically cultivating itself to be used as baby food for these wasp larvae. A similar usage of fungi takes place with the stingless bees and monascus fungus. As the stingless bee makes new nests and moves from old to new, they carry fungal spores and chunks of mycelium to grow in their new hive as food for their larvae. Then there are the species of insect that literally cultivate fungus as if it was some kind of crop plant. In these cases, the insect will literally help plant and grow the fungi by feeding it and protecting it, and in return, the fungi will allow the ants, or the insect, it's usually ants, they'll allow the insect to eat a non-lethal portion of its newly grown biomass. Several species of ants are known to do this with fungi, as are African savanna termites, which grow their fungi of choice in their termite mounds. And there's also ambrosia beetles, which grow their fungi of choice in the bark of the trees that they live in. Fungi also grows within insects, in a symbiotic relationship that is much more chemical than agricultural. These fungi, typically single-celled yeasts, 
exist in the guts of insects, where they help the insect break down and digest food, while taking a very little bit of it for themselves. This is analogous to the bacteria in your gut, and in my gut, and every other human's guts, and we need this gut bacteria to help us digest the food that we eat. Just as endomycorrhizal fungi have a strategic access point into a plant's body that allows them to either be beneficial mutualists or dangerous parasites, the fungi that have adapted to live inside an insect's body are also subject to this dichotomy. Some fungi are beneficial, helping the insect digest its food, while others are parasitic, and they hurt the insect, and can even kill it, by stealing its nutrients and growing within its body to devastating effect. The absorptive hyphae spread throughout the insect's exoskeleton, and soak up all of the water and nutrients out of the hemolymph, draining their host dry. This is the case for the infamous Ophiocordyceps fungi, which are known to turn their insect hosts into zombies. Once they've slithered their hyphae underneath the insect's exoskeleton, they can manipulate its body to do what it wants, to help the fungi find a good spot to spread its spores and infect more insects. And on that gruesome note, I think we've come to the end of this episode, and to the end of this series on fungal physiology. Truth be told, I've really only scratched the surface of this amazing aspect of biology. All of this stuff about fungus and fungal ecology is wicked cool, so I strongly encourage you to do your own studying. A good place to start would be with anything that's been written or recorded by Paul Stamets, a world-famous mycologist. If you're a fan of the Joe Rogan Experience, which is the world's most successful podcast, Paul Stamets has been a featured guest on that show multiple times, so you should also go and check out those episodes too. Mr. Stamets can provide you so much more information on fungi than I could ever hope to give you, so if you're interested in this, I really recommend that you go and check that stuff out. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, then hit that like button and share it with your friends. And if you like all my content and you want to see more biology episodes right when they come out, then subscribe to the podcast. And as always, thanks for listening. Oh.